All right. Colby Acuff. Did I pronounce that last name correctly? Yeah, you did. Correct. Cool, man. You're a, you're a new guy on the scene, but your music's awesome. I was listening to a lot of it today and, and leading up for a while here. And um, with somebody like yourself, it's, I think it's fun to give a little bit of a backstory. And I don't know if we've ever had anybody west on from Idaho, have we? But we, so. we had a viral post on the site, like an Idaho road rage video, where two guys like beat the hell out of each other. <laughs> and then they get up and shake right. each other's hands. Yeah, it's classy here. And then they know, and then they get in their car. Classy just drive away. Is that true? Yeah. Is that is that a, a accurate representation of Idaho and the folks that live there? I mean, honestly, ninety nine percent of the people who live here would I would say are the nicest people on earth. You know, it's kind of got that, that yeah. Midwest mentality. Uh, a lot of nice people, just you know. But yeah, but that's the thing. You know, if you are going to get in a fight, you're going to shake hands at the end of it because that's just the way it is. <laughs> I love that. You're, you're probably a- related to the guy more or less. You know. We can send you the video <laughs> after. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> and what part of Idaho are you from? So I'm from northern Idaho. So way up in the panhandle. It's this little lake town called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, about 50,000 people live in my hometown and about 150,000 in the county. So I knew, I knew the answer to that, but I just wanted to hear you say it because I didn't know how to pronounce it. And I wanted you to say it's it. It's a hard <laughs> one, yeah. We were saying before, I was like, I went to Paris like, I don't know, five years ago with my wife and not my wife at the time, but um, got engaged shortly after. But like, you know, Paris and all the, it's a French named town, right? right city. And then, True. so I was like, oh shit, I don't know if I've, I've, I've lost my, my ways here in pronouncing this, but it was named like the best place to live in America, right? Or the ho- highest housing market costs or it, it, yeah, it's blown it's up gotten, like insane, right? It's gotten a little crazy here. Um, when I grew up here, you know, it was just a little, it was starting to get a little touristy and we had tourism, but I mean, this is crazy. It's, I'd say the last five years, you know, has gotten out of control. I mean, we made, it seems like every year we make the number one fastest growing, you know, city in the country, but we're not even a city. We just built our very first like high rise condo last year. So it's, it's getting bigger and bigger. The housing market's nuts though. Any famous people that live there? I thought I heard something on the radio here. And I thought I misheard it, so I want to hear if, if there are. If, if you it's know. uh, it's getting more and more. There's a, there's like a, um, kind of like a resort kind of thing okay. for the. Uh, it's called Gaza Ranch, and there's a lot of people who live there. Like, I mean, you know, Kanye and Kim Kardashian, and uh, you know, any fame like Wayne Gretzky belongs there. He's there full time. So there's a lot of people that live on the lake. I don't know why area. I thought John Elway lived there. I thought I heard. Oh, he does. Weird. He lives. Oh. He's been here for years, though. He was one of the first ones to be here. He was Early here after. Like, <laughs> yeah, 10, 15 years. He ago. takes his private jet to the Broncos home games, and then he just shoots it back. Is what I. Come yeah, from. it's pretty much yeah, yeah. Do Kim, do you do Kim and Kanye have separate places there, or are they? <laughs> I don't know. I had never been. I'm <laughs> I'm not there quite yet. Yeah. <laughs> You got to get that Miller Lite sponsorship and then you're fucking Oh, dude, cooking. I want it so bad. <laughs> Big I want Miller so Lite guy? Oh, huge. And I'm to the point now, I throw in all of our music videos. I, we have a song dropping in, uh, later this, uh, like for the summer song. It's already had a decent amount of uh, people know about. It. It's called Bad Day to Be a Beer. And we throw a lot of Miller Lite in there. And I'm just to the point now where, you know, I just want them to know like, I just want to be on their radar. So either they're going to yeah. sue me or they're going to sponsor me. They're not going to sue you. I'm just saying it's one or the other. It's, <laughs> I'm going to just make all this Miller Lite stuff and put it in all my videos and throw it in everything. And then we'll see. Well, we started happens. working with Bush. So sorry. Bush yeah. <laughs> I like Bush too. I like, all I like a lot of, you know, I, been... I think it, I had it down like as a, a funny point of conversation, probably if you're a Miller Lite. Miller Lite, Bud Light, Coors Light, right? They're all, to me, like, I'll ha- I'll be happy with any of them. Are you one of these people that was like, I won't drink the others? Or no, no, you- no. Actually, I got a Coors right here for my second round. Yeah. But I, <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, no, I, I'll drink any kind of beer. I'm a big beer drinker. Um, Same. But Miller Lite is 100% the way to go. Gr- my dad is very much Miller Lite only, pretty much, so. If I'm not mistaken, I might have said this before in the podcast. Um, Matthew McConaughey's brother named his son Miller Light with a Y, Miller Light McConaughey. 
and got a, like a lifetime supply of Miller Lite or something, I believe. I might be off, but I think that's what happened. That's what I want. I want to just change my name to Miller Lite with no Y. <laughs> Miller Lite. <laughs> sue me. <laughs> It'd be perfect. It could be your stage name, just Miller Lite Acuff, and then yeah, people the, would love that. It's not a mouthful or like. I mean, the hangover is a lot or... less from these like cheaper light lager beers mm-hmm. than I have a few in the garage fridge. Like um, Wes, what you like more, like the IPA hazy, whatever the fuck. <sighs> I could have one. It's seven percent, so I, that's what gets me. If it's my first beer of the day and it's seven percent, it's cold and it's okay. That's a nice base because then you kind of feel the buzz right away. But man, I, I cannot have more than a couple of those fucking things. And the Hangover to me is oh, it's unbearable. Brutal. It's brutal. I, I tell you, the there's like an evolution with beer drinking. It's like when you're like, well. Let's call it right when you turn 21, but really, you know, 18, 19, 18, yeah. whatever, 14. 20, <laughs> you're drinking what, yeah, whatever you can get your hands on kind of thing, you know, like, oh, this beer, you take it, mine, Keystone, you know. Bush Light. Yeah. And then Red once Dog. you're in college or whatever, you're just buying cheap beer or whatever. And then once you turn 21, you go into the bars, you're, you're still drinking cheap beer, but you're like, oh, what's this IPA thing going on? Mm-hmm. You start drinking these IPAs, you think you're super, now you're adulting. It's like your first like little adult thing. You're like maybe you have a glass of wine, but you're going to drink this nice IPA. And then that lasts for about a year because you just can't drink IPAs like that. And the hangover ends up being terrible. And then when you turn 25, you just go right back to the good old stuff and you just stick with it. No, you nailed it. Yeah, you nailed it because when I when I got um got married, had a kid and then moved and got a house out here from moving from like a high rise in Chicago to a house in Colorado. Right. The first thing I did was like garage fridge for beer. And then the beer I got was almost like 75 percent of the time. It's like the bush light, the Coors light, the and it's like I I definitely went back to that. I appreciate wine more now, but I appreciate cocktails more now. But like I almost appreciate a light beer more so now than I did when we were like pounding 30 of them in a night back in the day in college. You know what I mean? It's like, you're like, Oh, this is nice. Montucky cold snacks. Another great beer. You guys have those up there. I I assume. Cause Oh yeah. They're out of Montana. Yeah. Oh yeah. Idaho, like the ski resorts here in Northern Idaho were like some of the, you know, besides Mm -hmm. in Montana, were like some of the very first places to get them. Yeah. Those are fucking those. I've never had a beer. I don't know. That's like, you can tell it's not like cheap, but you can just drink them and just drink them all day in the summer beautiful right. thing like an enjoyable marathon beer i yeah, think you need like beer. a you need like a case of a, a bush light a miller light in your fridge and then you need like a six pack of maybe something just like a little fancier like a montucky or something like it's, that it's <laughs> funny i i actually went to montucky's i did a but budweiser a bud heavy but heavy. i was a part of uh i was a part of this beer drop thing for about a year where they'd send me just a box of Orderly random thing. beers from all over the country and i got a nice little beer fridge that my girlfriend got for me and i just fill that thing up you know with uh sorry got a weird phone call all of a sudden but i just fill it up with you know all these beers that i was getting and then uh i just pretty much people come over and i just be like oh yeah take whatever you want whatever beers you guys want in there i'd never drink them I just drank yeah. the Miller Lite the entire time. Yeah. You know, it was gar- never that garage, that garage beer fridge or the beer fridge. That's like a, that's a, that's a necessity as you get older. Um, wow. But going from that to the music, read your bio. For people that don't know, like, who are some of your heroes? Who are some of the people that kind of got you into this, this? place of playing music because I saw you you started when you were 11 if I'm not mistaken so you started at a young age but who were some of the people maybe back then and then today that you kind of like look up to that you kind of well when I got started I mean so I started playing um guitar when I was yeah about uh yeah 11 or so but I was actually over in Montana on a hunting trip and I ended up meeting some people at in the middle of nowhere um name well their band used to be called the garrett brothers and one of them ended up playing for uh kenny chesney down the line and he was playing for kenny chesney at the time and i met him and they were a huge um part of you know they gave me a guitar to start off with learn how to play that they were super nice uh, and always invited me to the jam every year um and 
definitely kind of showed me at a young age how to kind of do this and gave me a lot of good points and stuff. And then from there, you know, um, that's like more of like a personal connection I had with somebody who definitely mentored me in a, in a great way to, you know, push me out um, to do this. But as far as people I've never met and, you know, people, their writing and young influences on my life and the sound, you know, that's going to be uh, Waylon, um, Hank Sr. Um, I listen to a ton of Merle. Um, I love, love Bobby Bear. And, um, you know, some of those older guys, a lot of the outlaw stuff I really like. And then the newer guys, I really love Sturgill Simpson, a uh, huge fan of Tyler Childers um and I, I mean i love like mike and the moon pies is like a, another more recent band um there's a lot of them out there obviously but um yeah i mean musical heroes influences shows i mean as far as shows go i was obsessed with eric church mm. um when i very first time i ever saw him um i got kenny chesney tickets from the guy i was talking about earlier and we got to go backstage and i got to watch Eric Church opened for Kenny Chesney backstage. Right. It tells you the how long ago it tour, was. Right? Yeah, and it blew me away. What he was, I mean, I just was like, this is what it's about. Like, no chains and no bullshit. Like, it's it's not, it's so free and, like, not scripted at all. Like, you're just doing, the crowd is going to send you something and you're going to take that and send something back. And it's just that game all night. And that's our live show is more based on it. Nothing is, uh, it's all pretty raw, you know? I'm glad you said that. Cause and Wes, you can piggyback off of this. If you don't like, we, we, it's funny. Cause we'll catch shit. Like sometimes people, the annoying fan for us, I think is like, how can you guys say you like Tyler Childers, but then also like Eric Church, he's like really staunch. Like, and it's like, come on, like, you can you can appreciate stuff even if if one guy's not quote unquote mainstream one guy quote unquote is it's very easy to appreciate like a great performer a great writer a great musician a great um right. whatever all that stuff so like excuse me i'll say the same thing about eric church like everybody that follows whiskey riff knows how much we love eric church kid more but all they, they all have in common is like that live show you're 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 in it like you're exhausted when you leave you're this you're that like it's because right. when you see a bad one it's so bad and i'm always of the impression that if ever like garth brooks all, we we bust his balls like great live show but my god is it at times corny right so you can oh, yeah. feel the moments where it's like right, awkward if you're just like a guy with a sense of humor you're like this is awkward right with eric church it's not it's like you're like oh my god i want to run through a fucking wall like right it's so super even if raw. you don't I, yeah even if you don't say you're like no i only like these types of traditionalist artists today i don't think there's a person that could go to an eric church show that hasn't been to one and leave and go i don't like eric church i don't i just don't think it's possible like no I just, and that's the thing like if someone says oh i don't like eric church i, I would say go to one of his shows yeah. yeah like just you know there's so many aspects of being an artist and I think there's, you know, a lot of, not a lot of people realize <laughs> as far as like the fans go and um, fans of all walks, you know, it's the expectation is always a 10 for an artist yeah. to a fan base. And they don't, they don't like nine. They want 10 every time, you know, once you get fans and like, once you have an audience, they don't want you to be a nine because they're also, you know, every time they get past the aux chord, they're going to play your songs. So if their friends check you out, they want to, you know, and they, and for them, that's the perception of reality. My perception of reality is I got to wear 20 hats a day and try to make all this work. And, you know, it's, it's a job, it's a business and it's a career and it's a shit ton of work to get to that 10 every time. And we're not going to meet that every time, but you know what I mean? Um, so it's a lot of high expectations and it's not fair to the artist, no matter who art, you know, which artist it is to basically you know, take them down for, for one thing, but not giving them the opportunity to show their light in another facet. Mm -hmm. Well, That's and awesome. some artists excel at other aspects of, <laughs> like some guys are great songwriters, you know, and then some right. people have a live show that'll knock you on your ass. And it's like, I think being able to appreciate each artist for what they bring to the table 
is probably more valuable than just like, I mean, yeah, some people do it all really, really well. And it's like, yeah, that's why they're the best in the business. But then I think sometimes you can be like, well, you know, it's a good songwriter. Eh, sometimes the production isn't there for me on the album or, you know, oh, their right. live show is great, but eh, the songs are a little cheesy. Yeah, you know, like, I think You're we're right. probably better served as even in a totally. critic capacity is being able to recognize some of the positive things. And then like, but it's hard to convey that nuance, at least for me and Steve on through whiskey riff where like fans are like not nah, sucks pop country it's like okay fuck no, it. like <laughs> you guys are kind of screwed i'm not gonna lie you guys are a little screwed <laughs> on the fence but yeah i mean well though no, we're in a weird position but but the reason it works and the reason people like relate to us and the reason whiskey riff has become the biggest countryside there is like is for that very reason it's like even though there's the you know the loud minority saying you can't like this or you can't actually a lot of yeah. people love riley green and then love sturgill simpson right like they yeah. they don't mind those two like being on the playlist and like that's just if you're if you're a totally against mainstream country is it like you hate it all that shit that's on the radio we're with you most of the time but if if the worst of it to you is like luke combs and eric church it's pretty damn good like that's right. a lot yeah. better than what we had five <laughs> six years ago like so you and, should be and, fucking happy that's what's uh, getting played a lot more oh yeah days. and it could be so much worse and I, I i still think though there's i mean in my mind there is something to be said about how some there's a certain percentage of country music fans who only specifically like the underdog so yeah they only like the up and coming and if that up and coming goes mainstream they hate them all of a sudden they, Sell hate out. Them. They, they just hate them and you know it's like one thing i've always said is i don't really care i i do not care how you make it in this industry because that's definitely not my place to judge however you make it if you can make this a career TikTok. it's a hell of a oh, hard job oh. huh? yeah take it take it and run <laughs> but once you're there once you're on the main stage don't be an asshole. Like yeah. once you're there, treat it like you would if you were, you know, before. Like what what did you want to do when you got there? Do that. Because you already have the platform. Now, you know, people are gonna hate you and love you, and you're gonna be fine no matter what you do. You just gotta once you're there, you just gotta know what you wanted before, I feel like, and keep with that MO. Well, speaking of like church and the live show, now he's playing like three and a half hour sets completely by himself in stadiums. And then you mentioned like Sergio and Tyler, who before the pandemic shit, they were going to do a, a joint tour right. playing arenas and, and stuff like that. And then now Turnpike's back together and they're drawing like an insane amount of fans, so much so that like they could probably like do some arenas right now. Oh yeah, and I think they, they could sell out arenas in certain parts of the country. But like in Texas, but oh, yeah. I think now Oklahoma, you're trying to see Oklahoma. some of those people come out of the woodwork who are like exactly what you were saying. Like, man, I used to be able to see them at Canes, you know, and it was. Well, they're like, getting was, pissed now because the and, tickets like, are a thousand dollars a piece, right? And it's like the resellers, value, resellers, and it's just like, and I'm part of, part of me like, yeah, it's nice. It's nice. It's great to see everybody in a dive bar front row, you know. But like, if you you want your artist your favorite artist to be successful and to play more shows right and play m bigger arenas but then at the same time it's like yeah you might gotta then you gotta pay more for tickets and i it's just kind of a weird like the life you, you you hold on to you it. should be I, happy for the artist though like you should as long be. as they and don't sell out like sell out in the actual right like become i mean we nice guy but like a luke luke bryan always has like a few songs on every album that are really really good Right. really really and good and no, matter who, no matter who you are in country music everybody will agree like oh that's a good song like everybody agrees even like the staunchest of critics but is it, you're just like man if he went back to that shit when he first started where the whole album was like that my god who would he be today like he's not this guy yeah. he's he's a he's a, a guy with kids and he's grinding on stage it's like you're in your 40s man like stop yeah, I but mean, it's like, I think, oh, it's the money maker. It's the money maker. Like my <laughs> hips, like they don't lie. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but no, seriously. It's a, no, I, I, I go it's like, a, what are you? Thing. Aren't you embarrassed? No, like I think, spring spring break. Like you're forty. You're not on spring break. Like stop singing about it. Like, and then he does finally, and you're just 
scratching your head. He's like, how much money is too much money? Just for that. Yeah. Like, I mean, there's I a know. lot of ways you can make money in this industry. That's what I'm saying. Like you have your platform, especially someone is, you know, if you already have that kind of following, you, you could stop doing that. And people will still like, like they'll still go to your show. Sergio, Sergio was like, oh, fuck it. I'm going to make a metal album. I'm going to make it or whatever. Yeah. Rock yeah album. Right. Whatever a... he wants. Um, yeah. I mean, that's. Were you what, what are, you, what are your of... goals though, when it comes to like the industry and, um, is there any, you know, pull to go to like a Nashville or a Texas, or are you just trying to build your base there and keep doing what you're doing? Cause you like, obviously with streaming now you can kind of do it your way in a lot of, in a lot of ways, but, um, yeah, I mean, for us, sky's the limit. Um, you know, we, I don't have a cap and I, I don't, the reason why I got into this business, um, professionally i've been playing my entire life and i kind of um had put it on the back burner because i just wanted to see what else was out there and every single thing i got into was oh well there's a you know there's a ceiling there's a ceiling there's a ceiling there's a ceiling no matter what you wanted to do and i said well what what could i do where there's not a ceiling and it brought me back to music and you know we we work really really hard uh, to grow every year as much as possible we reach way farther than we can grab every single year because it just rolls over and you just keep reaching um, my goals are not defined I mean I have certain goals you know I guess that would be every year but um, yeah as big as we can possibly make it I saw that you tweeted that you were in the Sonic Ranch or headed to the Sonic Ranch Yep. Yeah. We, uh, we just, we just cut our, well, we're about to drop our first single, um, February 18th. It's called once in a lifetime. Um, it's, I'm so excited for this project. We traditionally, you know, our, our first two albums, our first album is really just very, just me, guitar, bass player, a little bit of here and there, the producer playing guitar, super, um, Raw. Yeah, it's super raw. Zach Our Brian second album. Stuff we get. Yeah. Zach right. Bryan raw. Not yeah. Yeah. That raw. Like he's in a garage with his buddies. I don't know if you're a fan of Zach Bryan at all, but yeah, oh yeah. I love the, that type of story, like yourself, like in him, and like those type of artists. So like that's why I brought it up. Oh yeah, no, I mean, and it's exactly what it is, man. I mean, we, I, I mean, I don't know. It's just crazy that we're here now and everything with the how it came to be. But our second album, we went back to the same place. Um, but I wanted to be, it was way more mature is what I call our second album. Like our sophomore album is like, oh my God, people actually want to listen to me. Okay. Now what do we do? Okay. Let's do this. And so, I mean, once I wrote, if I were the devil, I pretty much knew how the album was going to feel and look. So then I just wrote another nine songs to accompany that. And I wanted it to be a grassroots album, super raw, you know, exactly like how it is when we go play a show. At the time, it was just me and a bass player. We didn't have a full band. The shows were, they were packed, but we weren't playing anywhere crazy. So then once we went through kind of some time with If I Were the Devil, we picked up the full band. And so all of 2021, we played with a five-piece band and it was absolutely rocking. So it was just like our show yeah. all of a sudden became this like very larger than life thing, um, you know, per night or whatever we were playing it was just a lot bigger than what we were used to um and so all of this next album it's the album is going to be called honky tonk heaven and all the songs on it are i mean there's three slow songs more traditional country but all the songs are basically honky tonk music um honky tonk outlaw um just it's more to represent like what we do night after night that i was i was googling real quick when you were talking because i've noticed that some some songs like where they grammatically put the incorrect title like if i was say if you said if i was the devil correct that's incorrect right, right? were the devil did you guys actually like google that like what's the proper or did was that just how it came out <laughs> it's because i saw no, it's how it came out it, it's uh like, so oh, grady smith devil. actually posted about somebody grammatically putting an incorrect title was it miranda or somebody and somebody did a similar one correct and i was like oh, now it's like always in my head about <laughs> if somebody titles something you know it's funny no one ever talks about this but this is a serious pain in the ass about music is when you're going so you spend six months on an album 
Like you, you, you spin right in it, you go record it. You work, you know, we worked eight, 12 hour days to record this album. So then you come back, you're working on mixing, you're setting, mixing and mastering. Anyway, you listen to this thing 2000 times. And by the time you get it done, send it back packaged, you know, now you got to go through and do the, all of it. You got to submit it to dis, uh, distribution and all this stuff. And you, everything has to be perfect because if it drops, like say you drop and you actually put the wrong audio file for a title and all of a sudden you're listening to, you know, for example, you click on if I were the devil and you get dying breed and you're like, what the hell? to take that off it's a huge process <laughs> so like everything has to be a hundred percent the way you want it and it's extremely stressful and like very tedious stuff no one ever talks about that yeah. but then again a lot of people have uh, i'd be me in the corner like hey guys <laughs> like if i was a, song, <laughs> a lot of a people you know, it's, a lot of artists have people who do that shit for them yeah yeah I do not. I mean, I we don't even have a booking agency right now. We There's songs on the fucking radio manager. where they mispronounce. They, they use like the grammar is always like it's yeah. almost like intentionally wrong, is what it right. feels I like. Right. I mean, yeah. When Dustin Lynch definitely... is singing, you're like, want to fucking jump out of your fucking window. Yeah, <laughs> that's a whole different <laughs> podcast. <laughs> oh, that's this podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I just man, I'd have to have a whole another hour for that. Um. How how many hats are you wearing right now? Just kind of give some of the fans like a and like an insight and kind of your day to day is like kind of whether it's managing, booking, uh, doing merch, press, kind of like how many how many hats are you wearing these days? So yeah, basically it'd probably be easier to explain it like we have so the people that uh, I work with, let's say. I have a five-piece band, including me. So I have four guys, musicians. I have a sound guy. That's all on the front end, travel with us. Yeah. Um, then I have a guy who works the back end for me. So he's like a digital growth marketer. And me and him run the company together on the back end. And then I have uh, a gal who helps me book and who runs all my merch with me. And she sometimes travels with us and runs merch table and stuff like that. That's it. Mm. So and like, I wear every other hat besides that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you I mean, think? It's similar to, you know, when we were starting, it's chaos, like it was, chaos but fun for, chaos. Right, yeah, just organized chaos. That's what yeah, like it's say. fun. And I'm the sort kind of, of person, too, where I got to have, <laughs> I'm the kind of person where I want my hands in it. You know, I know how the business works. I know how to run the business. And I don't want to be relieved of being a part of the business. Right. But I do want to be relieved of like booking, let's say. Like I'm really our goal for this year is to get a good booking deal. Really. I mean, yeah. we have people all over, you know, that want to see us come play. I'm like, dude, it's it, and it people really underestimate how hard it is. And it's almost kind of like, you know, a label where if you don't have one of the, let's say, five or six booking deals it's pretty hard to get a gig somewhere where you've never been before. Cause it's hard yeah. for that venue to trust you. You know, even though we have all the data that supports that we would be fine, that doesn't matter to them. We don't have the right email address for them to sign off basically. Yeah. They're looking for a William Morris on the end of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're looking for something like that. And so for us, it's, it's hard. Cause I mean, our biggest fan base right now is in Texas, uh, Atlanta, Chicago, um, hmm. Like those are like all of our biggest fan bases and to get to go play a show in one of those cities, we can't touch them. Yeah, it's really hard for us. Like we booked our own thing going through Texas and it worked fine, but it should have been something else. You know what I mean? It should have been something more just because of the fact that we could have sold tickets to those events and stuff. And it just, you know, that's been our biggest um, struggle just to be completely translucent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking for, of the light, oh, go ahead, Wes. I was going to say, just from my own knowledge, it's kind of the way booking works. And maybe, because I don't think fans, there's a lot of things about the music business that I don't think the casual fan really necessarily understands. So, like, how does the booking process necessarily work? Is it like, hey, shoot an email, I'd like to play at your venue? Like, and here's my thing? And here's my bracket for, like, this is the... Like, I think I can draw this many tickets, and I will And this is what this I expect many. to get paid? Or how does... Like, yeah, I, I mean... Yeah, so... The, there's uh it's so all over the board i'll give you a good example though so we wanted to play some festivals this year okay so in order for us to get let's say five festivals 
you know, and we're probably not even going to get them. I bet we get two of them. Maybe we'll see. We sent out 350 emails. Jeez. Jeez. And because we don't have the right email, it's not going to work. No, they're not yeah, going to open yeah. it. You know, they, they have their booking agents and we're on a hope and a prayer, but we got to send 350 Hail Marys to get five. So, and it's funny because like, you know, and not to be, it's hard, you know, because we put so much work into it and we truly are a very family based company, you know, obviously from what I've been talking about, like we don't have, um, we're just kind of like a mom and pop that is somehow doing, you know, some national stuff, but you know, last year booking our own shows, we, we played 55 shows last year, um, that were public in total. We played about 75 shows last summer and out of 55 shows, we had 31 sold out shows in up here in the PNW and our listening base is a fraction of what it is up here compared to what it is down south right so that, that's kind of you know that's kind of our goal i guess um but it's, a lot of people don't realize how hard it is i guess to book oh, and yeah. it's all over the place if they don't think that, that you can sell tickets they're going to chart they're going to pay you way less at a flat rate yeah so you know we just i don't know well, the, there's no the, good answer but the grind um and, and i leave experiences we're, we're nowhere near where we want to be but like the grind of it right like if you just like snapped your fingers and you were famous like to a point where you're selling out stadiums that's not fun no no it's like overnight success <laughs> is totally overrated no totally yeah. completely and like we we've been grinding our like gr- i was gonna say grinding our asses off that's like a, <laughs> that's like a <laughs> that's, we've been that's, for, that's for the Cardi B bills that's for cardi b's podcast when we have her on <laughs> hopefully um but no like but you're just like working and working and working and like you start to get into this like mindset sometimes if you have like a bad stretch where you're just like can i catch a break but as soon as you say that you're just like shit like that's the wrong mindset like i cannot sure. have this catch a break yeah. mindset yeah. because i make my own breaks right yeah. totally the and work is going to pay there, off for you guys. Like I, I don't like big... the, the meal ticket mentality where yeah. because of the fact that you can play and you can write and you can sing, you expect to make three TikToks and boom, all of a sudden you have a meal ticket to, you know, the grand feast. Well, that's fine and all, but, you know, for someone like us, like our band, you know, we're playing we're still playing 80 shows a year you know whether or not we're gonna get a deal or not we're gonna play 80 shows you're young how sorry how old are you i'm 25 dude like that's what i'm saying like you're 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 in that like trajectory like your mindset's so perfect that mentality you're talking as soon as you're like man can i catch a break you completely destroy the anything that you had done that was a success like Mm. you're just completely taking anything good out of the equation and you're just asking for more instead of looking at what you have kind of thing. And I, you know, and it's hard it, with, especially with the way that social media and the way that Spotify is, you know, the fact that you can, it's a good thing and a bad thing that you can see how many monthly listeners someone has as an artist, Yeah. because you're already playing the comparison game so much. And it's, it's hard. I mean, it, it's just like mentally, it's exhausting when you're just constantly looking at data and numbers and you're comparing to other people and you're also trying to, stay super positive which you know but once again like i look at it as holy shit we just passed two hundred thousand monthly listeners not oh my god how do we only have you know i mean there's so many people that are trying just to get to that spot and so you're you know i'm just thankful to be where we are because it's i mean it's one in a million to even i mean move to nashville (laughs) i mean come on it's some boy from Northern Idaho all of a sudden is on the Whiskey Riff podcast. It's like, you got to be shitting me. Uh, yeah. It's unbelievable. <laughs> we'll send so. you the PayPal. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, you're not going to be... Like- Oh, God. you're not going to be on the vo- you're not going to be on the voice next season episode, uh, season 37 five. I don't even know. Like, they do four seasons a year. Like, it's... Yeah, no. 
that was never. My <laughs> Does thing. anything make you like somebody less than than being a judge on The Voice? Like, <laughs> I used to like, like, I used to not mind Blake Shelton. Like, he has obviously some great songs back in the day, like a lot of really bad songs. But he also just Blake always seemed like a guy along. that you would want to drink with and have a good time with, and he could definitely he he's an encyclopedia of knowledge for like the old shit and. And then he becomes this Hollywood guy. And I'm just like, yeah. fuck off. Like, I, I don't want anything to do with you now. Like, I don't want to listen Dude, to your music. I don't want to, I don't know. It's just, hard I'm though, just, I, I don't want to sound also. And I'm not saying that I would, because I love, I mean, I don't know, man. In my mind, I chose this and I chose it hard and I'm digging in really hard. And I love this job. I also, I'm, I'm just like anyone else. I love to bitch and complain. But that's how I know I love my job because I can sit yeah, down every right. day and bitch and complain, but also it's coming from passion. Right. And also work for eight to 10 hours a day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And have no problems. I love it. Um, but I do think there's sometimes maybe an artist, and I'm not saying this is Blake Shelton necessarily, but some of these people who end up down the road, kicking the can down the road way, you know, long from now. And they're just like, I don't want to do this anymore, but I, I can't not like, what if, you just like Blake Shelton all of a sudden yeah. was like, no, I'm actually going to go be an accountant. Like that doesn't really work. So he, <laughs> you know, in my mind, they're just, man, I can't believe I'm speaking on behalf of this, but I just would say, you know, maybe they're just like, well, this would be a really easy way to stay in the limelight. To make more release money than I ever made as an artist. Release yeah. a few songs <laughs> a year and they'll definitely get on the radio. And Play some singles, yeah. yeah. He just sold his catalog, I forget to who, for like $50 million dollars. Quietly. Are you thinking of Kenny Chesney? No, Blake did it too oh, last Blake year. Did. That's why he was number nine on the most paid musicians last year. I just saw this in Rolling oh Stone, but he sold it for fifty million, and then Kenny just sold his too. I'm like, dude, he's trying, he's trying to buy an island just like the whole day damn island. Dude, fifty mil. I mean, yeah, but then it's crazy though, because like, well, I don't know. For me, the the songs owning the assets and owning the songs just going into the business part of it are so important to me because that's like my retirement right like right yeah you know at least in my mind i could stop music tomorrow and eh, i mean no one be it'd be like oh whatever happened to that colby guy they'd be like ah he's just living in north idaho doing his thing fishing (laughs) but there'd still be some people that would probably listen to if i were the devil and die and breathe a few of those songs and those would still be paying out now, if I can just keep this going, obviously, then it's great. But owning those assets are great because, you know, those are – if you can get it to where it's passive income, it's it's great. And then it just keeps going. Well, like, that's – When you talk about people just, like, riding off into the sunset, like Chris Cagle, the guy we grew up yeah. listening to, just was like, yeah. I'm done. Yeah. Dude, it's <laughs> just hard, like, And not people that old. Totally, it, it, you know, it uh, kind of going back – He was good. About, like, with people judging like as soon as an artist gets really big and successful um i mean i got to, it, it being under let's just call it like being in the up and coming or you know just, just that next spot above just underneath what we're talking about that 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 middle spot where you're you're selling out clubs you're selling out bars buzz like is you're there. not playing stadiums and you're in that <laughs> And you're you're the constant opening slot. It is it, it it's hard. It yeah. it is a hard lifestyle. Like you gotta want it to travel that much and to play in that many bars and every weekend is just that it's just what it is. It's exactly what you would think it would be. Um, but take the romance out of it. They you gotta take the filter off of it and realize how hard that really is. Yeah. And you know, if you do that for 10 years it's just not everyone's going to be able to stick that out. Most people are going to walk away. Well, and then it's like, when you're on that level, it's like, if I play 80 shows a year, like you said, if I play a hundred shows a year, I can make more money. And I play 120 shows a year. And now I'm playing three days a week. I'm playing four days a week. Right. And then it's like, I'm drinking in all these bars and maybe I'm smoking in these bars. And it's like, right. and you're traveling and you're and traveling any you're day. You're not Taco drinking Bell. or smoking. You're driving. <laughs> Yeah, you're I mean, washing your face in a gas station bathroom and you're like dude it's insanity i mean i mean like for us to do we did texas this year and it was 4500 miles now granted we're a little out of the way but yeah you know i mean it's a lot of travel and even to play in idaho i mean jesus i mean we're eight hours from the capital we go down to play in the capital it's you know it's a yeah. 16 hour 
total drive time. Jesus. Do you, do you think you'll move because of that at all? Just to like get home yeah, base I mean, closer to places where you can tour more centrally? My like goal even, is to just have a place down south. Yeah. Somewhere in between Texas and Nashville. Nashville's tough though, man. I mean, I went down to Nashville, did a show. I was supposed to go in February, but we picked up a few shows, a couple of really good shows up here. So I don't think we're going to end, I'm going to end up going down there. Um, but Nashville's tough because the way, it's just the way that it's like, you're not going to go be playing a bunch of shows, you know, and you're, so you're kind of, like, it's turned into like the circle oversaturated. So over, it's just, you're writing you're, you're in my mind and i i got a lot of good friends down there and i'm not you know i'm not one to i don't i'm not spent enough time down there either to where i'm someone who's super well versed and just to open up this big book of secrets you know no, we always we always kind of like get annoyed with that we've been there we don't have a good time there but like we get annoyed with the la vibe of it if that makes sense and from the artist's perspective in my mind the way it seems let's say i moved down to nashville I'm going to give up 80 shows a year and basically have the business to go down there and play a few rounds a week and write with a bunch of people. And I got to write with somebody who wrote with somebody who wrote for Morgan Wallen, let's say. So I got to write with this guy first and he's got to like me. And then he'll take my song that I have half right on and he'll take it to this guy. And then that guy might spin it there. So by the time it gets done, there's three people on it, let's say. So then let's say I just get to go to the next guy and the next guy and the next guy. Well, Jesus, I mean, that's four years for me just to write maybe one song for somebody. And then I got to write a few more. Then I got to get a publishing deal. And by the time this whole thing, by the time I get my own record deal, I'm 35 and I've written like, let's say I've written four hits or five hits or more, you know, but that's kind of the latter versus the latter we're doing is it's fun. It's like, okay, I'm writing a ton. I'm writing you know, I mean, I'm writing all my own songs. I write all my own songs, release all my own songs. We play our own songs at our own shows. Yeah. We get paid instant or not instant gratification, but our gratification comes from what we've done. And yeah. it's a little different. It's definitely it's, a lot uh, different, I think. Yeah. In a good way. In a good way. Right. And so I would I wouldn't mind having maybe either either getting a something in Texas or something, maybe even like in Arkansas or uh i've been looking a little bit even so yeah. that could be a thing would you keep a place in idaho just to like obviously and then dude it's yeah i mean i've seen it's, pictures i, I wouldn't move <laughs> oh um, I, I, I think it was like my mom or somebody i knew that like a friend's daughter like moved to idaho and like was saying how much she was obsessed with it similarly me when i came out here like to colorado i was like right wanting to move somewhere <laughs> that was much more ingrained in like nature and just like calm type of thing right. and if that makes sense I, I just grew up i mean i grew up here and, and and i'm not like stuck here i mean i'm gone six seven months out of the year as it is anyway yeah. it doesn't even matter but if i can just be here in the fall to kill a few ducks catch a couple of steelhead and fly fish <laughs> like if i can just be here for two or three months like that would be amazing you know and it, and i need it that's the other thing like there's um where i live right now i'm 20 minutes from national forest no service and as far as you can see the goddamn canada trees where i don't have to deal with anything so if i want to go away for a day and get away from my phone and all the bullshit if i want to wear zero hats for a day i'm only 20 minutes from and that's what and that's i I feel like that's just what matters yeah you know we're living in a time where everything's so fucking chaotic and it's like when you can have that outlet and just disconnect it's like sign me up like uh, yeah. well yeah and you can get lost in it i think that's the other thing you know and this is uh this is just the truth i mean the truth is someone like me who is a new guy on the scene kind of just now kind of getting a stance in the scene for us we got to make you know our, I'm not saying that our reality is completely false, but you know what you see anyone post on social media and is not real life. Yeah, you know that's just not real. Like you, you're gonna have good days and bad days, and on social media you can't post about a bad day. You know you got to make it look like every day is a great day. And so that's what it is. And so if I couldn't get out of service and like reset, I could. It just I don't know how you could do it. I don't know how if you didn't get away from it for a little bit and take a break, I don't know how you couldn't get lost in it basically and not be yourself anymore. And just, you know, 
fade into something weird. Yeah. Become a weird caricature of like the industry and your yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's and... you totally. It doesn't take very much to forget why you got into it. Is kind of what I've mm-hmm. realized. You know, it was just like for me at least i don't know i mean i've always been i'm a pretty stubborn person self-admittedly and i you could just ask my girlfriend she'd agree um but you know for me it's i'm pretty stubborn on the fact that i want to stay me i'm not gonna sell and sell out you know i'm not gonna change who i am because i might add a couple zeros at the end of a paycheck it's like hey Five zero. You five wear zero. a cowboy hat, but like, um, I speaking of like Sean, wasn't it? Wes, we talked about it a couple of times in the pack. Like they asked him, "You're good, but you should smoke a pack of cigarettes a day to make your voice a little more gravelly." And like yeah. all of these things that they do in Nashville to try to get people to like Kim Moore song. Um, uh, what right was it? On? Yeah, like Reck- reckless. Yeah. I think it was reckless. Right. Like put, put a cowboy hat on. Like. <laughs> Get yourself a rhinestone suit. I mean, some of the shit Midland catches is because <laughs> people say it's like, like not real or whatever. Like so with those suits and stuff. But like, it's a real thing, right? Like being yourself, well, kind of like doing it your way, but like not selling out in a, in a way. Of it's like I, I hate to like single anybody out. Like I was single with Dustin Lynch on more than Kane Brown, and in, in sense, like your first song was so good. It was right. so good and you look like the next coming of like this sounds like george Strait. like i'm not saying he was but like it sounded right. in that vein yeah. and then all of a sudden you just go to this pop route to catch money and it's just like fuck man like really we we well, we could have chased money a lot of times and we did it right and i think that's the key though and that's i mean in my mind the new age of music the new age of artists it i mean i don't know i I'm obsessed with country music history as well. It's a really weird little like feather in my cap. Maybe we should do just, some, some some stuff with you on a regular basis then, because we love that shit too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty I'm pretty well versed. I, I'm like obsessed with it. But this reminds me so much of the Waylon era, the Waylon and Willie era, where there's a lot of commotion, a lot of friction between honestly Nashville. It used to be Nashville, yeah. Texas, but now the friction is everywhere because it's consumer's choice. The consumer gets to pick who's famous now, not so much a boardroom. And it, you know, it's good and bad, but it, there's a lot of good to it, especially for the artists. And so, you know, this opens a lot of doors for a guy like me, where now I'm in a position where, you know, I don't have to sell. We can keep growing this business. And like, you know, going back to what I was saying earlier, if we get a booking deal and we can fill a schedule, <laughs> we're done. Like that's, we're great. We'll grow this yeah. business as far as we want it to go. As long as I can have someone who says, I'm like, Hey, this is where, this is what we want to do. And they said, okay, we'll get you a show in there. Like I have no doubt in my mind that we can grow this business to where we want it to be. Yeah. It's kind of exactly what they did back in the, yeah. Back in the Wayland era. I love it. Before we wrap up here, what's on the horizon, what's coming up. I know you mentioned that <laughs> some album and some music. And so just so, so people know what's going on. Yeah, no, yeah. So we have a new album drop in uh, sometime in 2022. Uh, new single drops February 18th, Once in a Lifetime. Um, and we got a few more singles drop in, uh, like be in spring, probably early to late spring. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited. Cannot wait to uh, share all this new music with everyone. Awesome, dude. I, right I, I think people are going to love your shit. And yeah, you, we'll you share make, the hell out you of make it. the legit. <laughs> style of country music that we like so tip of the cap to you and uh, well i appreciate it guys seriously it's been fun it's good to meet y'all